So first talk is by Daniel Lenz from Vienna. He's going to talk about pure point diffraction. I, I think people online didn't hear. OK, thank you. Thank you, Leavitt. Thanks, everybody. I'm, um, I'll start now. Um, I, uh, I feel quite excited to give a talk here. And I understand it's uh, the first talk of, of this conference, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm honored <laughs> to talk here and to see um, or hear <laughs> all these uh, familiar uh, people. I, I want to talk on um, pure point diffraction. And, um, and this is a topic I, I have been involved with for um, about 20 years now. And I think my, my real involvement actually started in, in Canada. That, that was a conference in Victoria. I think it was in 2001, maybe 2002, and was organized by, by Johannes Kellenbonk and Ian Putnam, and I think also Moody. And um, in any case, so I, I, I met Bob there and also I was in contact with Michael Barke and we, um, we started a collaboration. And I think for, for at least for me, that, that was very, uh, influential in terms of what I was doing mathematically and um, and I and I think uh, I, uh, for, for, for a while um, I, I was then collaborating with Bob and um, and for a while I would go to Victoria in summer and, and work with him on things and I I, in, I, I thought about it when, when preparing my talk and I it, it felt to me that it was a decade that I would go to Victoria every summer but then I realized it was only two or three times, but it had a lot of impact on me. So it really felt like <laughs> I, I had this whole decade. And, and I think it, it comes from two sources. Uh, so one source is we did, I, I felt very excited by the mathematics we did, but, but also I think there is something personal. I think it um, has to do with Bob's personality. I always felt very calm and relaxed when, when uh, <laughs> Being with him and then coming uh, back from Victoria it was like being on a holiday, but like like being in, in contact with the core things. So I uh, I, I think that um, I, I very much appreciate it, and I, I'm I'm very thankful for having experienced this. <laughs> and I want to, um, given that it's a birthday conference, maybe I can share two more things. <laughs> uh, so so one is. Um, one is um, in one of um, in one of the works we had together when we had finished it and written the introduction, we came across something. It was not a mathematical plunder, but it was something which was somehow wrong in spirit, and we we found a shortcut and, and set up things differently. And um, and then <laughs> I thought, oh no, now we will have to change everything. And I went through the introduction. And then I realized that there was nothing that had to be changed in the introduction. It was completely right. It was completely the right spirit. It was everything was correct and nothing had to be adapted. And I think it came because Bob had written it. So for him, it was clear anyway how things would be. And it was just the minor things that there was this mathematics which had to be adopted later. And the and the, the other experience I want to share is that that was uh, really eye-opening. That, that is when I heard Bob give a talk on, um, on joint work with me. So I thought, okay, I, I, I know what this is about. <laughs> I have been uh, involved. I, I did my, my fair share in it. And then when I listened to him, I, I, I realized that no, <laughs> I had not understood what we were doing, but now I understood. So that is uh, that was quite an experience for me. So today I <laughs> I want to talk on uh, diffraction, and that is um yeah it kind of starts for me in 2001 in this conference in Victoria, and it is uh, with uh, two people from uh, Canada. So this is with uh, Nikolai Strungaro. Well, he has been in Canada for now quite some time, and Timo Spindler, which I made here kind of an honorary person from uh, Edmonton. I think um, I think by now. Um, he is um, he is in uh, in Bielefeld, um, but uh, anyway, <laughs> he used to be with the Miku at one point, and this is uh, <laughs> when we did this uh, work. So I I want to do the following. I want to, to give an introduction into what um, what 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 the topic is, kind of um, so in in spirit, philosophically, or basically from physics, and then I will come to the mathematics. Uh, and to the setup. So there's a little break here. And, um, and this is also why um, the introduction is not numbered. The introduction is kind of fluffy. 
And then the setup uh, will be mathematics, and we will talk about uh, definitions and how, uh, how uh, they may or may not uh, be related. And um, then, then um, the setup or the, the behind are some natural basic questions, and I will introduce these questions. And then I will talk on uh, the, um, the main results that we uh, have on, on these questions. Okay, so the the introduction. Um, well, there is a article of um, Bomieri and Taylor from uh, eighty six, and the title is um, "Which Distributions of Matter Diffract: An Initial Investigation." And I think the article has been very um, influential. It's a kind of pivotal article for for the field. So they they set up uh, various things. Um, not all of them proven, but but rather a kind of a um, challenge in some sense, <laughs> make sense out of what is written there. <laughs> and um, a, a big piece of motivation, our main motivation uh, for the article is um, that there were new form of, of order discovered in, in certain materials in, in 82 uh, by, by, by Schechtmann in diffraction experiments. And um, I will make a little drawing in a moment. And later, these uh, materials were called quasar crystal, and they got a um, Nobel Prize in chemistry for the discovery. And what the experiment showed was um, it said the substance had these sharp break peaks, and that that should mean that whatever the substance is, it had some long range order. So sharp peaks comes from a lot of interference, and that means there's order. But also what you saw about this tenfold symmetry, <laughs> and that, that should mean that the substance, whatever it, it is, it's not a lattice. So it's a long range order, and it's uh, not uh, a lattice. And um, mathematically, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the, the way to talk about this is uh, that coined the, the notion of aperiodic order, and the um, material itself, they were called quasi crystals. And um, I want to make a little drawing for the um, for the um, for the experiment. So what they did is, so they had a piece of matter here, and they put some X rays or electrons through it. And um, well, they they go through the material, and they do some interference, and then they go out and to keep it on a screen. And here you have your piece of matter. Um, and um, you, you have these X rays. And um, what you see on the screen is not some cloudy structure, but rather these peaks. And these peaks um, that I indicated there have these two features. So, well, they are peaks. <laughs> and they have this tenfold symmetry. Okay, and that, that together means, so the peaks mean odd, a lot of interference, a lot of things are canceled. Maybe more expect there to be some cloudy structure. <laughs> everything is everywhere, but now uh, everything is nowhere except on the peaks, and there's this symmetry, and you put it together to aperiodic order. And the, the piece of matter um, of these, the order in these pieces of matter is called um, is called um, aperiodic order, and the pieces are called quasi crystals. If you want to model this, and I will be more specific along my talk, you 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 start with a maybe something some lambda, which should be the the points, the atoms, and you um, associate a quantity. Uh -huh. gamma, which is called the autocorrelation. So these are the position of the atoms. This is called autocorrelation. And autocorrelation is kind of an auxiliary quantity. We will um, we'll talk about how, how serious we have to take it. 
and then we will do a Fourier transform and we get a thing which is called gamma hat, um, Fourier transform of gamma, it's the um, diffraction measure. So that is a serious quantity. Diffraction measure. And the gamma hat is really what describes the outcome of the diffraction experiment. So the, the, the thing you start with is this lambda, the position of the atoms, or the description of your piece of matter, and the outcome is the diffraction measure, and there is an auxiliary quantity in between. And um, well, and this is this is what what was um, considered. And there is this phenomenon, and the phenomenon again is everything. These uh, peaks are well known from uh, from order from from crystals, from uh, from periodic structures. But here you have these peaks, and it is not a crystal. It's not a periodic structure. So it's it's something different, and that has attracted a, a lot of. Um, attention. <laughs> this is what this uh, field of uh, aperiodic order is about. And this diffraction is kind of a core experiment in this. And um, yeah, it's uh, probably known to, to, to many people here. Still, I, I may uh, <laughs> shortly uh, tell this. So Schechtmann, who did these experiments, he was not believed in the community because they kind of knew <laughs> that this cannot be, that you have peaks with a 10-fold symmetry. It's impossible. There's no lattice, there are no peaks. <laughs> and it took him quite a while and you can see it. So the publication of Schechtmann is from um, 84 and the experiment is from 82, so it's two years. So now these two years, this may or may not <laughs> be the common time you need to publish something in mathematics, but it's not at all the common time it needs to publish something in physics. This is more something which is done within weeks. So there you can see how much disbelief he, uh, he, he, um, he was facing. And, um, and, and various people, uh, famous people argued that it must be wrong, cannot be, but it's not wrong. It's a, it's a new phenomenon. Okay, so now, now let's, let's start and do um, mathematics out of this. So how, um, how is this done? Well, um, again, so what is the part that we want to do mathematics? It's, it's kind of um, this here, right? This is what, what should be uh, given a precise sense and which should uh, be turned into um, definitions. So the systematic um, setup um, in, in mathematics. Daniel? Comes from, yeah? Um, we have a very strong echo in your presentation and it, it does not seem to be here. Could you try with your laptop to switch off your loudspeaker because it might be a feedback in your own laptop? Oh, sorry. I, okay. I know. I'm not sure it's the reason, but let's try because we hear you twice. Even oh, no, no. You good, I mean, it's very important it so well. what I say, but it's not worth being heard twice. <laughs> okay, I switched it off. Um, oh, so that's <laughs> a different reason. No, okay. okay. I, I hope it's better now. Um, let me, um, if you hear me and it's not better, let me know. <laughs> um, good. So the, the systematic setup for diffraction theory or for mathematical diffraction theory is um, for these substances comes from Hof. It is done in two um, articles in the, in the 90s. And it has to be precise, of course, in physics and uh, for periodic uh, structures, this is much older. This is uh, 120 years old. There's work of, of von Lauer and Bragg and they did it at the beginning of the 20th century and got Nobel prizes for this. Um, so it's, it's well understood how to do um, diffraction for um, periodic substances, but for these aperiodic substances, it was not clear and that, that comes from half. And he did it for Euclidean space and um, later um, it was generalized um, by, by various people. And um, I, I, um, I include some, some names here. So there's some, um, well, there's work of Barker and Moody and there's work of Schlottmann and they were very much concerned with um, generalizing it from Euclidean space to, to arbitrary locally compact Euclidean groups. So by now you can, let's say we have a G which is a locally compact Euclidean group. And if you, if you like, you can just think Euclidean space in, in N dimensions or if you prefer in three dimensions. So just not ordinary Euclidean space. And then we have a sequence uh, A, it's the sequence of subsets A, N. It's a Van Hover sequence. So you can just think of cubes of uh, side length, uh, small n. 
Okay, and with these data, there is a thing coming. This is the dual group G hat of G, and these are the continuous group homomorphisms to the unit circle. So you you have the unit circle, kind of the the simplest and ugly compact Abelian group. So then um, the dual group is the maps which respect the group structures, uh, which go from the group to the simplest uh, group. Um, and in, in, in Euclidean space, uh, which we kind of can think of in this talk, um, you can think that the dual group is again R to the N, namely, if you have an K in R to the N, you can associate it to the function which maps X to uh, E to the I K X. So for Euclidean space, the, the group and the dual group uh, may, may seem the same, which, which is a cause of some confusion. <laughs> I mean, structurally, they are very different. But uh, but uh, um, they are the same uh, as well in in this uh, particular case. Okay, so that is the the setup. Um, so that that's kind of the quantities. So there's no <laughs> diffraction yet. So let's look at now at um diffraction, and we'll do it first for a finite uh, point set, and we call it lambda. So uh, remember, what we want to model is our, our piece of matter, or rather maybe the positions of the atoms. So we take a finite uh, point set lambda in Euclidean space. And uh, what we think is, so you have all these atoms here, and there is a kind of a wave coming from each of these outgoing wave. So um, you do the, you look at a delta lambda, which means you put a, point mass on each uh, point of lambda, and you call it the Dirac comp, and that melts the piece of matter. And then uh, from each of these pieces, you have a, a wave emanating. So that is the exponential minus i x uh, xi. That is the Fourier transform of delta lambda xi if you sum over all x in lambda. So that models the outgoing waves. So you have here your points, and each gives rise to a wave, and you sum all of these waves. And that um, is described mathematically by taking the Fourier transform. And then what you really see on the screen is, is not so much the, the waves, but the intensity of the waves. And um, this is a, a model or that means what you look at, you take the modulus of the Fourier transform and you square it. This is the intensity. So you started with lambda, which is the position of your atom, so to speak. You put a point mass on each uh, point of lambda, and you call the thing which come from this the Dirac comp. You take the Fourier transform of the Dirac comp and models the outgoing waves, and you take the, the square here, and um, this is the intensity. And there is um, a way of alternative description. If you, if you do this here, um, well, if you take this sum, and you, 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 you square it, well, you get the sum over all x in lambda and y in lambda over this here, the complex conjugate. So it's e to the i x minus y um, xi. This is just taking the, the modulus square of this. And another way to describe it would be to say, ah, it's the Fourier transform of the convolution of delta lambda with uh, the reflected version of itself. Okay, so that is diffraction for a finite point that's well uh, understood. Now, um, if you want to uh, do diffraction for these uh, objects that we have in mind for the periodic ones, um, actually, you, you do a little approximation. Uh, you approximate this finite point set by an infinite point set in order to get rid of some boundary effects. I mean, just to, to um, uh, to um, argue for this, I mean, you have really many, many atoms, <laughs> and uh, it's it's a high number. So it can think of it for all practical purposes. It's like having infinitely many atoms. It's it's really a big chunk compared to the uh, dimension of the atoms that you have. And then to get rid, as I said, of these boundary effects, you model it by an infinite thing. So if what we have done here is nice. But to, to, to model these big, <laughs> comparatively big things, we want to model things by an infinite piece. 
Um, and this is also if you say a crystal is, is periodic, I mean, yeah, but you think that the crystal fills the whole space, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense to say it's periodic <laughs> if it doesn't fill the whole space. So let's 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 do this. So we we start our program, so to speak, <laughs> this three-step program. So we want to do the same. So um, we have an infinite point set lambda. Well, we can write down delta lambda again. This is the sum over all x and lambda delta x. So this is no issue at all. So delta x is a point mass. So we add just these uh, point masses. Then we do the Fourier transform. So let's, let's just write it down. So f delta lambda of xi, this is the sum over all x and lambda e to the minus i x xi. And here it, it's a bit awkward because it's an infinite sum and each term has modulus one. So it's not, uh, <laughs> It's not supposed to exist in an ordinary sense. Still, you may say, yeah, 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 Let, let's do distribution theory or something. And you, you can try and do this. But then we are only here, but we don't want to be here. We want to be here. We want to do the intensity. And this is where things really get out of control because we want to take the modulus square. And you, you, may, you may manage to give a sense to this infinite diverging sum by distribution theory, but, but there is no way how you can uh, give sense to this um, modular square of a distribution or some whatever object. So this is not defined at all. So, um, so as we go along, things uh, become less and less defined. So that, that means we have to, um, well, we have to think again. And what is actually happening here is that, well, yeah, it's, it's a mathematical problem. No, it's not defined. So this diverges and this is not defined. This is at first a problem in mathematics, but, but there's a reason for this. And the reason is from physics. And the reason is that it's the wrong quantity. What we do here somehow is we look at some, if you want to say some total intensity now, if you have an infinite uh, array of scatterers, the total intensity is, is infinite. So it, it must diverge. There's a, a good reason that, <laughs> that it diverges. It's just too much. So we should do something different. And what one should do is one should do some average. We are not interested in the total um, intensity. The total intensity does diverge. What we really see on a screen or what we want to look at is the intensity per unit volume. We will have to average. And it's really this averaging where this uh, Van Hover sequence plays a role. So let's, let's, let's try again. So here's the solution, average. And that means we don't look at total intensity, but intensity per unit volume. And that is done as follows. So we have this lambda. Lambda is infinitely many points. But we assume that if you, intersect lambda with one of these a n's or these cubes of side length n, we assume that this is finite for all n. And for example, that, that would be the case if there's a positive minimal distance between points of lambda. So you have your atoms, and then it's, uh, it's a very natural assumption that there's a minimal distance between uh, these um, atoms and physicists have some, some name for this. And I think it's, it's perfectly natural to assume this. And then, this quantity, the intensity of lambda intersected a n will exist. Why? Well, lambda intersected a n is a finite set. And for finite sets, just we have a good theory. For finite sets, we know what to do. We do delta lambda, we take the Fourier transform and we look at the intensity. Daniel, can you hear me? So now we do the same here. We have this finite set. And then we average, Daniel? so that is the intensity, which kind of comes from the part of lambda inside a n, and we average by the volume of a n. So it's kind of the average intensity of lambda restricted to a n by or per uh, a n. So that's an averaged uh, intensity, averaged by the volume, and then we take the limit. So at, at this point, there's uh, some 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 hope involved. So there is no reason why the limit should exist. So we, we assume that the limit exists. And I will come back to this in a moment. But if Daniel? the limit exists, then this is a good quantity. 
Um, that is intensity per unit volume, because we have looked at the intensity of lambda intersected a n. We have averaged and we have taken the limit. So it's 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 the correct quantity to be called intensity per unit volume. It may or may not exist, but let's assume for a moment it does. Then, by what we have done already, we know that this here is the Fourier transform. So we can say it's the limit from here of the Fourier transform of the intersect um, of the convolution. Uh, lambda intersected a n convolved with delta minus lambda intersected a n and averaged by a n. Okay. Now the Fourier transform is uh, continuous if, if you think about vague convergence of measures. All of these are measures. Assume that these measures converge, then the Fourier transform of this, um, um, the limit of these Fourier transforms will be the Fourier transform of the limit. Um, and you call this limit gamma. So this is really our assumption. Our assumption is that this limit exists. I have written it down here. Gamma is the limit in the vague sense of this. And if it exists, then actually the intensity per unit volume will be the free transform of this gamma. And that is the setup. This is the setup. <laughs> so we start with our lambda. We restrict it to some finite set. We get something finite that we can deal with. We get the intensity of the finite piece. We average it and we take the limit. And we do the computation and we see what we really compute is the free transform of a quantity gamma. Well, whose existence we assume. Okay. So that is the assumption. We assume that the limit gamma exists. Okay, good. So that, that is the, uh, the setup. And that is for, um, for point sets. Now, we want to have a bit more flexibility and actually uh, we need this. Uh, um, if, if you think about point sets, what you model with the point set is the position of the atoms. So the piece of information you can have by modeling things by point sets is the um, information, we have an atom there or there, or we don't have it. But in reality, maybe there are different types of atoms. So you want to model more. So the, the very least you should have is you should allow for coefficients in, um, in front of these point masses. Maybe you have two types of atoms and you should have two types of coefficients or two values for the coefficient. And actually there is a strong school which says, ah, forget about all these atoms. <laughs> we should model matter by functions, <laughs> by distribution functions. And then we can also argue for this. So I told you this point set approach, but there's this other school which uh, says, no, no, you should model um, matter by distribution functions. And that in the end leads to a general situation. We, we do the following, we model a piece of matter by a translation bounded measure on G. And I will tell you in a moment what this is. So that includes modeling uh, by point sets and it includes modeling by distribution functions. So it's very general. And actually in terms of the theory, it's not more complicated. And we have developed this very systematically in some work with um, Michael Barker. 2004. So let's. Um, oh, I'm. Uh -huh. I just get this text, uh, this message. I should double check if the volume of your iPad is turned off. Yeah, so with my iPad, I think I, I really did this. I, uh, <laughs> I will. I will have a look. I think I completely muted this, but I will look. Um, huh. Yeah, so I think I, I I'm not taking part in the audio with my iPad. Um, I I am not sure. Hmm. 
I'm not sure how much more I can do. No. iPad, you can go ahead. Um, so I, uh, okay. Oops. I, I hope I have switched off everything. I mean, I, I feel that I have now switched off everything I can. I, I hope I, I did. Um, Somebody else playing the stream in their computer. So, um, so we model um, by these uh, translation bounded measures. Uh, and um, th this is now the, the framework we look at. So the outcome of the diffraction experiment um, is um, described by um, what we call the diffraction measure. And the, the ingredient is the translation bounded measure mu. And there's an intermediate um, quantity um, and there's an intermediate, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a bit distracted by all these things happening in the chat. So <laughs> I, think, um, I, I hear that some people do not have an echo, so which is good news to me. So I will, um, I will continue. Um, yeah. So, um, so what, are, where are we? So we have a, Translation bounded measure mu, which is the generalization of our um, lambda before. So what used to be lambda is now the translation bounded measure mu. And it, um, in particular, it includes measuring, uh, modeling point sets and uh, modeling things by, by distribution functions. And the outcome is a measure gamma hat. And the way to do it is we start with mu. We do something which is called the Eberlein convolution and I built define it precisely in a moment and we got the autocorrelation gamma and then we do a Fourier transform and we get the diffraction measure. And um, now um, I, I understand that I have not defined gamma at the moment, I will define it uh, sh uh, shortly. I want to tell you two things to, to, to keep in mind. So if you think about gamma hat, it's a precise version of this F mu uh, modulus square. So this is this avenue model square is something which does not exist, but the gamma hat is something that does exist. <laughs> so this is why it's good. It does exist and it models what we want to have. And the phenomenon of interest is that this gamma hat is a pure point measure, right? So these are the two, two points to be kept in uh, mind. And there is a philosophical point or a technical point. It's, it's, uh, it's one of these rare occasions where philosophy and uh, technicality and mathematics meet. And this is concerns the autocorrelation and the, 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 the status. We don't need that the autocorrelation is a measure. We, we don't need anything about it. We just have to have a possibility to take its Fourier transform. So anything you, you manage to, <laughs> you, to take a Fourier transform of qualifies as an autocorrelation. And that actually gives us a lot of flexibility. So there's a lot of flexibility uh, in, in the work we have with um, Timo Spindler and Nikos Strungaru. And if you want to learn more about this, I, I, I very strongly urge you to, to ask Niku. So really this, this quantity is, there's nothing too strong that you need about it. Anything, if you manage to have a Fourier transform, it can be your autocorrelation. <laughs> it's just here. Here you want to measure a proper, honest, or not be the measure. And here you have a measure, but in between it, yeah, it can be anything. Good. 
So I should tell you how this is defined. So precise definitions. So by measure, I mean an element in the dual of uh, the uh, continuous function with compact support on G. Um, and I have some topology here, but I don't want to bother you. Translation bound means that if I take the measure and I convolve it with the phi in uh, CCG, then I get bounded function for all phi. So the measure should roughly, it should have the property that on compact sets, no matter where I, 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 I put them, the, 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 the mass stays bounded. And the Eberlein convolution is defined, you restrict your measure to AN and you reflect your measure and restrict this reflected version to minus AN, you take the usual convolution, you average by AN and you take the limit. So that's kind of this type of somewhat complicated limit that we did when, when talking about the autocorrelation. And again, the notes of the Eberlein convolution, this may or may not exist. So that, that is something we assume. Now to put this in, in, uh, into work, we need some theories. So the autocorrelation has a feature um, which is called positive def definiteness. So it is positive definite. And that means we can take the Fourier transform and the Fourier transform is a positive measure. So I just uh, mentioned this in case you are wondering, is there any mathematics or is this guy just throwing definitions at us? Yes, there is mathematics and I, I, I'm hiding. I'm hiding it in order not to, 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 to bother you, okay? So to, to, uh, to, to prove that this setup gives a quantity that we need or the type of quantity that we need, namely positive definite measure, a positive measure, we, we need some theory and to take the free transform. So let's, let's do a little summary. It's time for, for a summary. So what have we been doing? Well, we started with the finite thing. We have, we have a measure mu or finite set and we take um, the Fourier transform and we take the modulus the square of this and everything works fine. Well, equivalently, um, we could do these two steps by going from mu to the convolution, um, mu convolved with the um, reflected version and then take the Fourier transform. So this is what we can do for finite measures or finite uh, uh, sets of points. And we have replaced this and actually everything keeps the same. Oh yeah, well, you can say here, Fourier transform, sorry about this. We have replaced this uh, by, by, by replacing this uh, star here by the, this symbol. So it's really the convolution is replaced by the Eberlein convolution. The Fourier transform is replaced by the Fourier transform, which should mean it's a more general way to define the Fourier transform, but still it's the Fourier transform. And then everything works, right? So that, that is what is happening here in this setup for diffraction. You start with mu, you, you do a generalized form of convolution called Eberlein convolution, and that has a Fourier transform, and that is the object you want to have. Good. Now, what, what are now the questions? Now that we have uh, agreed on the, the setup, um, well, the first question is um, the following. Well, the question is about pure point diffraction. Assume that we are given the von Hober sequence A and we have a translation bounded measure mu and it has some autocorrelation gamma. Well, what we want to know is does a gamma hat, is gamma hat a pure point measure? Well, gamma hat pure point, this is the phenomenon, pure point diffraction. We want to know when is gamma hat a pure point measure, the free transform and diffraction measure. But actually we want more. <laughs> we want more than just uh, gamma hat being a pure point measure. We want to know where are the atoms of gamma hat. So you can also say um, it as follows. We want to information on the intensities. We want in terms of the measure mu that we start with, we want to know where are the atoms of gamma hat. So this is where we see the, the frag peaks. And we want to know what are the values of gamma hat. So what are the intensities, right? So we want the intensities. Knowing that gamma hat is a pure point measure is nice, <laughs> but we want to know more. We want to know where are the point and what is their intensities. In fact, we want even more. <laughs> um, what we describe here with the gamma hat is so to speak a norm square of mu. But what we really want, I mean, if we, if we uh, think about it, what would be nice is a full transform of mu. So that would be really cool to have a free transform of mu. 
And that is sometimes known as the phase problem. And I will explain this now, what, what I mean by this. So the first question is here. Yeah. <laughs> To a point diffraction, but now we come to, to, to intensities on the phase problem. And here I'm uh, referring to an article, um, influential uh, article of Lagarios, um, who, who set this uh, up. And um, according to him, you, you could say that the measure mu solves the phase problem along A of the following holes. So the autocorrelation gamma exists, some gamma hat is a pure point measure. Okay. And we have for each psi in G hat, so that is the dual group, think of R to the N if you like. We have a, um, what is called a free ball coefficient, I say, okay? So that mu is in some sense, so I have this tilde here, I will, uh, I will talk about in a moment. So mu is somehow this sum, whatever this means. And gamma hat, the diffraction measure that we have, is the sum over all psi in G hat, the, um, um, Axi uh, modulus square delta xi. And that is called the consistent phase property. So mu has an expansion of this form, and there are the xi coming in, and the xi squares. This is what you see in uh, gamma hat. So I will now discuss why this is what the phase problem and why this is what we are interested in. So, first is at least formally. This makes gamma hat a version of f mu modulus square. Why? Well, if mu is equal to this here, where we kind of replace this tilde by equal, then f mu, well, you take the Fourier transform of this, it's the sum of xi and xi, xi delta xi. So the Fourier transform of the character xi, so the Fourier transform of the character xi, that should be delta xi, so the Fourier transform of the sum of this here. And now if this is your measure, it's a point measure. If you take its modulus square, okay, I told you it's not clear how to take a modulus square of a measure, but it's a point measure, then, then um, well, it should actually be that you take the modulus square of the coefficients of the points. And then this is this, and by the consistent phase property, this is gamma hat, right? So if you have the consistent phase property, then the mu um, actually, if you take its Fourier transform and its square, you get gamma hat. So it is what it gives you what you want. Gamma hat is a version on this uh, modulus square here. The other thing is uh, why is it called phase problem? Well, in the gamma hat, what you see is you don't see the axis. You see the modulus or the modulus squares. So what is lost is really the phases of the axis. You can think of axis as being, well, having a phase and a, and a modulus, and you only see the modulus. So what you really withdraw here is the phases of the axis. So the phases are lost in gamma hat, and the problem really asked to withdraw the xi from you. Okay. Then there's this thing uh, I, I said here, there's this, um, this thing here. So here we, we have to do something. So the symbol here needs an interpretation. And that is already stated as an issue in this article of Lagarius. In some sense, you can say uh, making sense of the problem is part of the problem. We, we need something which we mean by mu being the sum. And I will tell you what we, what we mean or what we think. <laughs> and we, we think um, that it is like an expansion with respect to an orthonormal basis. And the orthonormal basis would be the basis of characters. Now the characters, <laughs> these are functions of modulus one on the whole group. So why, why are they orthogonal? Well, they are orthogonal if you take as inner product this thing here, you do the integral over a n of f times g, g modulus, and you average by a n and you take the limit. If, if this is your inner product, then the characters um, are orthogonal. And we think of this whole thing as kind of doing a Fourier expansion or doing an expansion of mu with respect to this orthonormal basis. Now you may um, you may be worried. <laughs> you say, okay, so what 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 Hilbert space are you talking about? What is your space? And I think you are right. You are right to be worried, but this is part of the work we do. There there is a, a very good space in which you can do this. For the moment, I, I give you interpretation for how to work. 
let me say um, let me say the following: that for each psi in the dual group, we want that the limit one over the um, mass of a m of psi s m u exists, and in this way, these I uh, say are directly given by mu. So this is this is what we mean. Okay. So with this definition here, I have now precisely stated the phase problem. Let's go back. So we want the autocorrelation to exist and we want gamma hat to be a pure point measure. And we want mu to be equal to this sum in the sense that um, if I take this limit of mu um, xi, it um, gives a xi and we want gamma hat to be given by this here. Okay. And I want to make uh, one more comment. So here we discussed this under the name of the phase problem. It's really a very crucial uh, thing. And um, accordingly, it has many names. So it is sometimes this thing or part of it are discussed under the name of the Bombieri-Taylor conjecture in mathematics or as a commutativity of the Wiener diagram in physics. So these, these two kind of uh, buzzwords uh, are somehow, yeah, more or less the same as the phase problem. Okay, then the question two becomes, when does mu solve the phase problem along a given A? Now, um, th that, that's a very um, kind of, uh, uh, well, that, 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 that is an important question. It keeps kind of um, all uh, the, the diffraction, if we can solve it, all the diffraction information that we want. But still, it's not the end of the story. We want even more uh, based on, on observation. Um, we want to say, ah, why should we stick to this A? <laughs> why, why fix on van Hover sequence? We should have that whatever we do is independent of the sequence A. And that is the third question which we call uniform phase problem. When does mu solve the phase problem along any van Hover sequence? So here we have a fixed van Hover sequence. And here we want a solution for the phase problem for any van Hover sequence. Okay, and this article of Lagayas basically says, basically states these three questions, and then it says, I mean, I'm summarizing. Uh, I, I guess, uh, <laughs> yeah, my, my my summary in in this respect would be uh, that that it then says, okay, now develop a suitable concept of almost periodicity to deal with these phase problems. I mean, there's more in this article, but but this is one one way to to read the corresponding parts of it. So develop a suitable concept of almost periodicity to deal with these uh, questions. Okay, so and that's uh, what we did, and here here are our results. So the first uh, theorem is the characterization of a pure point diffraction, and it says. Um, that a van Hover sequence A be given and let mu be a translation bounded measure and assume that the autocorrelation exists. So now if we assume that the autocorrelation exists, then gamma hat is a pure point measure. This is what we want if and only if mu is mean almost periodic. So um, it's, a, it's a perfect characterization. We have characterized what we want, pure point uh, measure, uh, by some almost periodicity property of mu. I will tell you what this almost periodicity property of mu is, okay? But for the moment, just bear with me. So there is a notion of almost periodicity, which has some average uh, flavor and, and it characterized gamma hat being a pure point measure. Then theorem two deals with a phase problem. Again, we are given a van Hover sequence A and we are given a translation bounded measure. Now, um, at this point, um, we have not assumed that the um, autocorrelation or the diffraction measure exists, and but here's the statement, mu solves the phase problem, which should imply that the um, diffraction measure exists and is pure point and the consistent phase property holds. And that is the case if and only if mu is Bezikovic almost periodic. So again, we have a solution of our problem in terms of an almost periodicity property. It's a different <laughs> almost periodicity is stronger than, than here. And I will tell you what it is. Um, if time permits. But for the moment, the, 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 the point is there is an almost periodicity property which fits exactly uh, this problem. And then theorem three is the uniform phase problem. Again, uh, mu is a translation bounded measure. 
This time we don't need a Van Hover sequence because of the uniform phase problem asks something for all Van Hover sequences. And then mu solves the phase problem along any Van Hover sequence if and only if it is right almost periodic. Okay. So again, I will be more specific about these periodicity features, but just what is the structure? The structure is each of the three problems, uh, the solutions to each of these three problems can be characterized by a suitable almost periodicity property. Okay, so let me, uh, yeah, so that's kind of the philosophy. Each theorem is the characterization of the desired property by means of an almost periodicity uh, feature. I want to make a few uh, remarks here. Um, so um, theorem uh, one generalizes a result of Solomyak and uh, of Barke Moody. Which, um, uh, and the um, uh, result of Guare and it answers question one. So uh, a little drawback is our point to be marked is that it assumes the existence of gamma. So theorem two and three, they have no precedence. They provide complete answers to question two and three, as well as to other specific questions of Nagayas. And um, I, uh, yeah, I should say another thing is, so the theorem two with this Bezikovich almost periodicity, it covers uh, all classes, or it seems to cover all classes of examples with pure point diffraction discussed so far. So that includes the weak model sets of maximal density. <laughs> but it's a very, uh, seems to, to, to cover the, uh, a lot of um, small of examples. And theorem three, this is about the vile almost periodicity that covers regular model sets and kind of the smooth dense Dirac and some generalized almost periodic measures which were introduced by Mayer in 2012. So in some sense, it seems that the, it covers the, um, the um, the examples. <laughs> okay, I want to make a further remark about these um, almost uh, periodicity notions. So this mean almost periodicity, in some sense, is around in in in, in hidden in some work of Solomyak and Guerre, and um, and um, yeah, but it doesn't seem to have been brought forward in in a specific way. <laughs> Bezikovic almost periodicity is, um, in, in contrary, it's a very well established concept. And, and, and actually it's, it's so well established there are even different approaches to it and which result in uh, different non-equivalent uh, versions. <laughs> so you can say this is, uh, this is fairly well understood. There are even contradicting definitions. And then uh, while almost uh, periodicity is uh, well established for functions. So um, for functions, this is what is true here. What we do is we need this for measures, but that comes about by kind of um, natural dualizing. Um, you say a measure mu is so-and-so almost periodic if the convolution the mu of phi is so-and-so almost periodic for all phi in CCG. So it's kind of the natural uh, way to do this. Okay. So now um, I have a few moments, so I will um, do the following instead of, um, I, I will tell you how we, how we said about, but I will not uh, tell you how we, how we carry it out. So first um, um, let's, let's look at two definitions or two, two notations. So if I have a function on G, I define the translated function um, by translating it. TTFS is F of S minus T. I translate the function. Also recall a set A is relatively dense if I find a compact set so that A plus C is G and a trigonometric polynomial is a linear combination of characters. Okay, so that's nice. Okay, so then uh, what is um, <laughs> the kind of the, 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 the mother of all almost periodicities is this poor almost periodicity and the function bounded continuous function is poor almost periodic. If um, the following three equivalent things hold, if you look at the um, set of translates of F or, or TNG that has compact closure in this set with respect to the subnorm. Or as we can also say for all epsilon closures bigger than zero, 
you look at the f minus the translated thing in the soup norm, and you want that the set of all t where this is smaller than epsilon is relatively dense. Or you can say there exists a sequence of trigonometric polynomials pn so that f minus pn in the soup norm goes to zero for n to infinity. So note all three uh, things here uh, deal with the soup norm. And now the, the notions of almost periodicity that we, uh, we um, deal with, they come about by replacing the soup norm here by some average norms. And in these average norms, it will not be true that these three things are equivalent, but they, they, are, they have different degrees of strength, right? So we do some average norm. And in this average norm, we do this or this or this, and then we, we, we are roughly, <laughs> with our generalized notions of almost periodicity. And to, to um, so that is one, one, one basic piece <laughs> uh, that I want to um, tell you. And the other basic piece um, that, that comes into us is I want to tell you why almost periodicity enters at all. Okay, so just to, to, to tell you, so there's, I, I'm far from giving you proof. <laughs> I just want to tell you two ingredients. So one is, how do these almost periodicity notions come about? And they come about by replacing the soup norm by average norms. And the other thing I want to tell you is why do we care about almost periodicity at all? And that comes from a well-known lemma and it's very well known and I think it's attributed to many well-known mathematicians. So I, I think I, thought, I learned about it as lemma of Wiener or lemma of Schwarz and then I did some research and it seems that, that one of the first places <laughs> it can be found is a book of Siegel. Uh, anyway, so I, I'm not going to <laughs> attribute this lemma to anybody. Uh, maybe in the audience there are, there are people who, who can, and I, I'm, uh, I'm happy to learn. Anyways, the content of the lemma is, is undisputed and it says the following. So let nu be a positive finite measure on um, g hat and f nu is its inverse Fourier transform. So that means f nu of t is the integral over g hat psi of t d psi. So forget about the inverse. So we have a finite measure and we have its Fourier transform. And now we ask, is it true that our measure nu is a pure point measure? This is somehow what we are, um, what our theory is about. Our theory is about pure point measures. And the answer is yes, it is, if and only if this inverse Fourier transform is or almost periodic. So, and here, let me write this soup norm. This is what we're talking about. So the, let me um, erase things, sorry. So, so we have a finite measure and there we can characterize pure pointedness by some soup norm thing. This is what is happening and it's well known. And I give you a proof of the simple direction. Any talk in mathematics should contain at least one proof. So here, let's do the simple direction. Assume that mu is the sum of Cj delta psi j, and this sum here is a, is a finite sum. Then we can do the Fourier transform and it's the sum over uh, Cj psi j. Now each character is um, a periodic function and this fi finite uh, approximations of these sums would be a, uh, um, uh, trigonometric polynomials, and due to this condition here, this converges in the soup norm, so it gives an almost periodic function. So this is almost periodic. So we have shown one uh, direction, a simple direction, and what we now do is that um, our our aim is not to deal with finite measures, but with infinite measures. So we go from finite to infinite measures, and we do so by replacing this soup norm here by other norms which come about from averaging. And this is kind of the, the behind our um, theorems up to some uh, <laughs> details that I will not talk about uh, now. Okay, I think this is a good point to stop. Ah, sorry, one, one more thing I want to tell you. <laughs> Just, um, you, um, we, we gave some results and characterized by some almost periodicity notions. And we have set up a theory. Now I want to stress, or I want to, to tell you that 
actually if one does some mild assumptions, and of course mildness, as I say, is in the eye of the beholder, then actually we, we have to end up with these Bezikovich almost periodic functions. So that is the content of this remark. So it's not only that the Bezikovich almost periodic functions solve this uh, phase problem. And in some sense, if you do a little bit of additional assumption, you must uh, actually have these, uh, you must uh, uh, look at these functions. Okay, now this is uh, really the, the, the end of my talks. Thank you for uh, your attention.